Happy Bees Meet the Candidates. This Cable 10 series allows you, the viewer, to hear directly from our candidates their views on issues that are important to our community. This is all leading up to the primary election, which has actually started now and goes until June 23rd. Voting is different this year, so we're doing things differently as we are social distancing. So we are uh, conducting our interviews from different locations. This year we took questions from social media and via email, so we have lots of topics to cover, uh, so we should jump right in. Today's guest is Jake Bonta, and he is running for jailer. Welcome. Thank you, Ms. Lindsay. Thank you, Plant Board, for having me. Um, I know this is kind of different than usual. It is. And I'd like to, I'd like to say I appreciate you all putting this together and giving the candidates an opportunity to speak to the public. Well, so thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's the least we can do uh, under the circumstances where it really hasn't been uh, the, the best circumstances to campaign. You can't do door to door and you can't have functions. So, uh, so this, this is your opportunity to, to let people know more about you, hence meet the candidates. So why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you decided to run for jailer. Thank you. Um, I'm 45 years old. I'm from Frankfurt. I've lived in Frankfurt most of my life, um, other than a few years in Shelby County, is which where I met my wife of 22 years, Melissa. Um, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, we moved back to Frankfurt and um, we raised our kids here in Frankfurt. Law enforcement career, I started my career in 2001 at the Frank County Regional Jail under James Kemper, and I started as a um, deputy jailer um, at the bottom and worked my way up, um, steadily getting promoted and ended up as um, a sergeant um, and worked through the shifts of shift supervisor, learning how to do some leadership stuff. Um, then I went to transport and was a supervisor there. And I learned a lot about the criminal justice system and because I was in court every day, um, I got to learn a lot about how the system works, the prosecutors, the judges, the attorneys. And um, in 2007, I had the opportunity um, to go to the Frank County Sheriff's Office. Um, I was hired by Steve Clark and sent to the police academy in um, Richmond. And again there, I started on night shift and Worked night shift for quite a while. I enjoyed it. Um, then um, I promoted to day shift, and um, and then I went to as um, a detective, and really enjoyed working cases. Um, I got to see gratification there of actually helping people. Um, you see some things you don't really want to see, but you had a gratification of actually helping people. Then I was promoted to um, supervisor over detectives, where I got to help work cases and then help other detectives. Um, got some leadership skills there. Got the opportunity to go to Police Academy, um, Academy of Supervision, which is a really, really good nationally known um, supervision uh, course. It was actually three weeks. I have over 13 hours that I calculated, and I didn't get a printout, but I calculated over 13 hours of law enforcement and leadership training. Um, I was appointed to Deller in um, September of 2019, after the current jailer Rick Rogers retired, I interviewed for the position and got it. And it's been an absolute challenge and blessing all at the same time. I enjoy a challenge, um, but with this COVID stuff, I, I think I got an extra dose. Um, but I was appointed in September. I, I told the public I had no plans at that time to run, and I didn't. Um, I started getting people to ask me to run. I started um, really, really enjoying working with these young officers and the older um, deputies. I say officers, it's deputy jailers um, at the jail. I love to watch that young officer come in with the big bright eyes and don't know anything and watch them proceed through their career. That is very enjoyable for me. Um, I enjoy helping people. And at the jail, you get to help somebody every day, whether you know it or not. And on the streets, as a police officer, you get to help people. As a detective, you get to help people. But at the jail, you get to help people at their very lowest. I enjoy that. Um, we've done some great things at the jail, and I'd like to continue on. Okay. Uh, for those who may not be in the know, 
uh, share with us what the responsibilities of a jailer are. <laughs> um, the, the jail is the safety and security of the inmates. Um, I have also the, the responsibility to look over the, the staff, um, which we're, we're staffed for 52. The courts asked me to go to 48 right now through the pandemic. And so we're there. Um, also beyond the safety, security and the employment, you're, you're working on trying to make your community better, make your community safe. We have a lot of programs at the Franklin County Regional Jail. Um, we have a lot of community service. Um, but the role right now that's going on right now is the physical responsibility of the taxpayer's money. And we're in, in a different time right now. And my number one job right now is, is the budget. And we've cut $245,000 from our budget from last year to, to now. And that could change again. We're still in, in budget session, but um, taking care of the taxpayers' money is, is, is up there in the top two or three. And it's very, very important, especially right now when we're looking at a revenue loss. Okay. So what, what would you say is the biggest issue fa facing the Franklin County Regional Jail right now? And how do you uh, propose to address it? As Jay, as right now, the biggest, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut Jay, you off. Sorry. <laughs> right now, the, the biggest issue is recovering from this pandemic. Um, we have to cut spending. We know that. We have to go after revenue. Um, but you're walking a tightrope there with that budget. How much do you cut and how many, you know, how much money do you cut from your budget where it's going to start affecting your revenue of, of raising revenue? Um, right now, recovery is number one. Um, before that, then we were looking at retention of officers we were looking at getting long-term officers to minimize mistakes and mistakes cause lawsuits um, which end up being paid by us and that was my mission before COVID and I want to get back to that but right now we have to recover which less spending going after hard work for revenue um, times have changed and we have to adapt to them so number one right now that is getting back to somewhat of a normal and and getting classes back going getting the community service programs going um the community service program is near and dear to my heart it's been there for a long time and, it, and as long as i'm there it's going to stay there it may be a little different version because of the amount of inmates that we will have and, and the staff that we have but I want to make sure that our inmates get to give back to our community the the community not too long ago, I did a little bit of math. We do over a million dollars worth of free labor at minimum wage um, in our community. And I know our community is, is missing those inmates. I, I know the guys on the trash trucks right now want them back. Um, and I want to get them back, but I want it to be safe too. We have done a fantastic job of keeping this, um, and I don't want to jinx myself, but we have done a fantastic job of keeping this virus out of our jail. And one person gets it, and it could be very, very bad. Um, I know it's not been popular to some. I'd like to thank the attorneys, the prosecutors, the judges, everybody involved, the arresting agencies with helping us. We've, we've reduced our numbers at the jail to give me space um, to be able to try to keep this virus out. There's other jails and other correctional um, institutes in the state of Kentucky right now that haven't been that lucky. and we've been blessed and I'd like to take the time to thank the judicial center um, and all the people that played a part in this um, emergency management health. Um, um, Absolutely. For, for sure. Support. Yeah, um, that, totally appreciate that. And that's leading me to my next question, which is obviously that we have seen outbreaks uh, of the coronavirus and other correctional facilities. So uh, what is your plan uh, to address in case there is a, an outbreak of COVID-19 at, at the jail? Well, it goes back to the numbers. Um, that's very, very important. Um, it gives me space. Um, it depends on if that outbreak, if that positive test is a state inmate or a county inmate, that's going to dictate which path we take um, for obvious reasons. But space is number one. We'll have to quarantine. We'll have to get with the medical um, personnel. We'll have to get with the health department and the physical court. 
and we'll do the best we can do to contain it and, and try to get that person the help they need medically. Okay. Uh, it has been noted that uh, the inmate population in the jail has decreased to approximately one third of capacity while the jail staff is at or near capacity. How would you address this issue to be more efficient while ensuring the safety of the inmates and the staff? Well, that's not correct. Okay. Um, the staff has, um, has, we were at 52 is what we're allotted for before this um, outbreak. Um, today I'm at around 46 okay. um, officers. So I'm down okay. right there. I'm down six immediately and I haven't hired anybody. Um, the number they've asked me to stay at is 48. Just because the number's down, the facility hasn't shrunk. There's still areas that we have to be manned um, or deputied, I should say. Um, the building hadn't shrunk, but the, uh, the inmates numbers have. They're gonna go back up as soon as the courts do. Um, we can cut the staff down, but what happens in, in a month when the courts open and I'm starting to get a whole lot more people in, more um, inmates in. So we have made cuts um, and we're staying busy. Um, I'm sending people out um, to the community, um, send them to the senior citizens. I'm still continuing. The mowing that we've done is still going. I'm finding things for people to do. Um, I'm constantly going, what are you doing today? What are you doing today? I went out and mowed. Um, it was kind of nice. I'd like to do it again. Um, it gets me out of the building a little bit. But the staff, is, we have lowered the staff temporarily or whatever the physical court ultimately decides to do. Um, but yes, we're down in, in, in inmates. And yes, we're, we are down in staff. And we'll see how the next couple months play out. Okay. If elected, what steps would you take to reduce the risk of litigation by inmates? Are you, are you speaking of lawsuits? Yes. Um, my number one plan prior to this was to work on, as, as the, the people have seen, my first proposal at the end of March in my, my budget was a large raise. Um, you pay them well, they'll stay. It also helps me get people from other um, agencies that have experience. Um, we call that, like in the police world, we call that a, a lateral. And I... When a guy calls me from, or a lady calls me from another county, my starting pay is $14 an hour. But to answer your question is we have to get a standard of training. We're, we're getting better with our training. Um, we have to retain people that have experience. Inexperience causes problems in an institution. So they just don't know. Um, we train them the best. They get a whole lot better training than they get than when I started 20 years ago. I got a set of keys and said, here you go. Our guys right now are two weeks in a training process. Um, we do a ride along program. It's kind of what I call it, where I put them on the hip of a seasoned officer and they get to see what it's all about. And then at the end of that day, they can decide if they want to come back or not because this line of work's not for everybody. Right. Um, it takes a certain kind of um, person to, to do that. Um, I hope that answered your question. Retention is huge. Education is huge in minimizing lawsuits. Um, I will say this in, in jails, you're going to more likely you're going to get sued. It's a matter if you have the, how can I say this correctly? You're going to get sued. It's a matter if, if, if you did anything wrong or not. Mm -hmm. So to minimize that education and retention is the answer for that. Okay. Well, you talked about training for um, staff. Um, if elected, what steps would you take to ensure that staff are properly trained to respond to emergency situations? And can you be more specific in an emergency situation? In law enforcement, that can well, mean the many different things. As far as I'm concerned, anytime you're dealing with something inside the jail, if something happens, it seems like it would be an emergency. I don't know. So really just proper training. How can you ensure that your staff is getting properly trained? And well, we're, we're at a two week process right now. I'd like to add a week to it eventually when <laughs> the budget allows it. Um, I don't know when that's going to be, uh, but when budget allows it, I would like to add a week 
uh, training, and the third week be some scenarios. Um, we have some really good people right now um, doing some training. I've kind of divided it up between two and three people um, that are very, very qualified in training and had lots of hours of, of, of instruction. Um, the, excuse me, the officers right now are um, required 24 hours of in-service. The police officers require 40 hours of in-service. I'd like to see that number go up. Um, I've heard um, speculations through the, the Jailers Association in the state that there's possibly an academy coming. Um, I'm all about that. I would, I would help in any way possible to get that set up. It, I think it's down the road some. Um, I think um, Department of Criminal Justice Training is, is going to assist with DOC and, and some of that. I think it's in the, the birth stages of that, but I'm all for that if I could send my, my new hires to an academy like I got to go to in the police academy. Um, I still wear my pen today from graduating police academy because it was, it was um, something I'll never forget. It was 18 weeks of my life. So <laughs> training is very, very important in anything we do, whether it's a police officer, if it's a, um, a deputy jailer, the more training you get, the better off you're going to be. Um, that's something I was allowed at the sheriff's office um, for most of my career you're required 80 hours. I mean, I'm sorry, 40 hours of in-service. I always took more because I wanted to learn as much as possible. Okay. And sometimes it just gives you a break. So I hope that answered your question. Yes, Ms. Thank you. <laughs> uh, next question is, what is your plan to ensure equal treat treatment of male and female inmates? That's a good question. Um, I would like to see um, some changes in that. I'd like to see the female pods um, be expanded. Um, we don't house, in numbers wise of, I think the last, don't quote me, but I think the last time I, um, this morning, I, I think I have like 15 females versus, you know, uh, 160 some males. I would like to, um, to expand their housing a little bit when they grow, when, when we get back to normal capacity, I would like to expand their training a little bit. And I mean by training, I mean by their classes, their um, NCRC um, career development classes, their GED classes. Um, you have to keep males and females separated. And I, I think, and we only have so much room at the jail. So if I could create some more space, I think that would help. Um, but I want to make sure they have everything that everybody else has. Okay. As a jailer, you will likely have to deal with the effects of the, the drug, drug epidemic that we are seeing not only in our county, but nationwide. How will you ensure that addicted inmates uh, get the necessary and critical treatment that they need? And how will you ensure that inmates do not have access to drugs within the facility? That's a fantastic question. Um, I was a narcotics de detective for a while and I fought the war against um, drugs in our community and I have seen firsthand what it does. Um, there is no foolproof plan. Um, I wish there was. Um, the jail has a body scanner now and it helps. It's a tool, but it doesn't catch everything. Um, and what I mean by that is people smuggling things into the jail. Um, the jail is a different um, jail than it was 20 years ago when I started. We dealt with alcohol and marijuana and cocaine, and that was about it. Um, the um, withdrawal is a serious problem at the jail. That brings up staff. Um, I have put people on 24-hour surveillance being watched by an officer. Um, that takes staff. Um, it also takes training. I'd like to add some training stuff in there. We're not medical people. Um, we're just not. And I would like to get some medical training to, so our officers, when they see withdrawal, they can get medical assistance quicker. We have 24 hour medical at the, at the jail. That's helped. Um, I think that started in October. Don't quote me on that. Um, but in October we start, that has been huge with, the, the drug epidemic. Um, 
of withdrawal, having a medical staff member make the call whether somebody needs to go to the hospital or not. Because as a jail staff, I would hope that we're making that call no matter what to go to the jail, whether they, if, if they need it or not to go. Um, but when you got medical staff there, that, that helps out a lot. Well, that was, that was actually my next question is how would you ensure that the medical program is adequate to handle the needs of the jail? Well, this is the first year 24 hour medical. So we're still, you know, working out some, some things. Um, they're also, the medical staff has the same issue as, as the law enforcement issues in across the country in staffing. Um, so they're doing the best they can to make sure that there's a, a nurse on staff around the clock. Um, and I'd say 90% of the time it is, it's not perfect. Um, but it, it has been hugely um, important for them to be there at night. Um, it really has. I can't really discuss a whole lot with it because of HIPAA laws and stuff of that nature, but I can tell you that 24 hour medical has saved lives. Okay. Uh, moving on, let's talk about innovative programming. Uh, what kind of programming would you implement in the jail that could be, you know, something that increases revenue or provides education for our inmates? What kind of stuff do you, do you have going on or, or hope to have going on? That's a fantastic question. You're doing really well. Um, more programs um, when budget allows it. Um, the RISE program that we're doing has been – I've been kind of keeping an eye on it. It's, it's fantastic. It's, um, it's helping people find jobs when they get out of the jail. Um, our NCRC um, program, um, I'm not really good at acronyms, but it's, it's for career development. National it's Career doing, Readiness Certificate. There you go. Um, I appreciate that. Um, the, the GED program is fantastic. Their numbers are through the roof. Um, the Thornhill Learning Center, they do a great job and they're all about it. And I try to help whenever um, they need something. And I, by, I'm not saying I'm a teacher by any means, but if they need to come up and test on Saturdays or they need, you know, access that's not, you know, on a normal basis, we try to assist when we can. Sure. So programs going after revenue. Um, we're always looking for different ways of going after revenue. I think the, the federal inmate, um, program is going to help us. The state inmate, all these people have been let out of jail that are state sentenced. <laughs> They're going to have to go back through the county program. You hope they don't. You know, as a society, we hope that they take this break that the governors gave them and they use it and learn from it. Mm -hmm. Do they? I don't know, but they have to go through the county um, court system, the district court system to the state system. How long is that going to take? So, we're going to get that back slowly. I think the federal inmates going to be quicker. There also um, there's house bills um, in motion right now. Um, I haven't working with the budget. I haven't had time to follow it this week um, or last week, but they're looking at the programs we have already in place um, doing like a per diem um, step. Um, if a state inmate finishes the rise program, they get a certain percentage rate on their per diem. That's revenue. They finish another 90 day program. They complete it. You get another bump in per diem that could equal out some serious revenue, but that's in the birth stages as well. Um, and we're already doing those. We don't do a SAP program. Um, prior to me being there, it, it just is, it didn't work. We didn't qualify. Um, I don't know the exact particulars of that, but it didn't qualify. And I'm and listening to the other jailers across the state, there's some there's some issues there with SAP. Um, I'm not sure because I'm not a SAP jail, but um, revenue can be there, but it's going to take some hard work now. And we're we're ready to do that. So on the opposite end of that, what what are your plans to cut costs? Because as you said before, we're going to have to cut costs. Well. Um, <laughs> My deputies aren't getting a raise this year. Yeah. Um, there's other county employees that's already got a raise this year. Mine aren't. Um, and they're still showing up to work. Um, because I, I preach every day, glass is half full. Be glad you got a job. There's a lot of people across the nation right now that are not working. Mm -hmm. So you can take something good out of something bad. 
And um, there's also other costs right now, you know, the, with the, the inmate population down, we're spending a little less. Um, when the inmate population goes back up, we're going to continue to try to spend a little bit less. Um, something that we've done that I learned from listening on a KJA conference call, um, there's a company out of Louisville that um, sells a bleach maker. I never heard of it before in my life until that, that day. Um, we spend money at the jail every year buying bleach. Lots of it. <laughs> we make our own now. Um, so we're, I'm, I cut $2,500, I believe it was, out of the custodial budget because I don't buy bleach no more. Yeah. There are ways to cut costs. You just have to tighten the they, – they said it in a the, in the meeting today, and it stuck home with me. You got to tighten the belt up. Um, and you have to go after revenue when you can. Mm -hmm. So less spending, make more. Um, I was told early on, um, you know, when you work on a budget, it's not like your home budget because it's much bigger. When you're in a recession, it's like your home budget. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really is. If I don't have the money to make that payment, I'm not going to buy it. Right. And that's how we're kind of looking at it at the jail right now. Spend less, make more because the whole county's in a deficit. We all have to, agency across agency has to help each other. Um, I'm not going to get a vehicle in my budget this year. Sheriff Choir has, has said he would help me with that. I appreciate it. We're going to help each other. Yeah. Well, uh, my last question is uh, how will you better improve communications and uh, both reporting to fiscal court and communications with the public about the good things that you all are doing at the jail and how you all are operating? The, I've been thinking about that since I've been appointed because normally no news from the jail is good news mm -hmm. <laughs> for 20 years. That's what it's been. Um, we have a Facebook page and um, we put some stuff out promotions and here lately people bringing us donuts and stuff of that nature. By the way, we love donuts. <laughs> um, you know, I need to learn how to communicate with the court a little bit better. I'm learning. Um, I'm not perfect. Um, but we work hard and, um, we're going to, we're going to work on that and, and make phone calls and, and stuff of that nature. And that goes both ways. I want them to call me when they have questions because I can't, you know, I don't know what they're, they're wanting to ask. Feel free to call uh, and I'll do the same when I have it. Um, so just communication is always a key between any agencies. Um, so you're constantly working on that, no matter what you're doing in life, it seems like. Yeah. Well, now's the time. I'm going to turn it over to you, and you can look directly into your camera and talk to our viewers who are voters and tell them why you're the best candidate for the position and why they should vote for you. Thank you. Miss Lindsay, thank you for having this today. Um, on a Memorial Day weekend with the flags behind you and stuff, I really appreciate it. Um, and I, and you, you did a great job. Um, Franklin County, I have been 19 years working for the county. I've had two jobs in Franklin County for 19 years, either at the jail or at the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. And I have loved almost every minute of it. And I have dedicated my adult life to service in Franklin County. Um, 19 years of service, thousands and thousands of hours of training. Um, I've worked my whole career to get to this point. My opponents have not. Um, I feel like education um, at the jail and having a strong desire to be better every day. Um, and it's about leadership and experience. And I have those qualities. Um, I, I, I can't walk the streets right now. I, I'm on TV, um, radio, the newspaper, Facebook. Um, I'm going to try to get to you and ha any questions you have go to there and I'll try to get back to you that way. Um, I'm reaching out in every way because this is a crazy voting session. Um, I think the clerk's office has done a great job to do the best they can do. Um, but we need you to go out and vote and, and let your voice be heard. I'd ask for your vote um, between I believe June 2nd to June 23rd um, to keep me as your jailer. Um, we are doing good things, and I would like to continue that. I'd love to continue my service in Franklin County. Um, you can go to jakebonniferjailer.com. That'll lead you to my Facebook page. Um, 
most importantly, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me today. And I know our viewers appreciate hearing from you as well. So to our viewers, I want to remind you, uh, voting is a little different this year. So be sure to go online at uh, govoteky.com to request your ballot. Uh, and then vote. Send that ballot back in or check into the times uh, that the county clerk's office is going to have in-person voting. And do it early. Uh, county clerk Jeff Hancock has said do it early. So get informed. That's what we're here for. Then voice your choice. So thank you so much. Uh, that's it for this edition of Meet the Candidates. We'll see you next time.